computer. Okay, great. And actually, let me go ahead and close my door because my cat's about to come in. Go down. Go down. All right. So the cat is now at bay. So that's good. All right. So uh, for today's lecture, we're going to go ahead and do a bit of a review. I will be sharing my slides with my uh, exam three hot topics that I think are the important parts that we're going to talk about today. And then I will share those slides uh, with, on Canvas after that. OK, uh, that's not doing what I wanted to do. So what I'll do is I'll do that. All right, so that being said, uh, we'll start with the review. Uh, about 20 minutes, we'll stop. We'll do the activity. And then I won't see you again until, um, uh, unless you have questions and have office hours or something. But you'll take uh, exam three on Wednesday. And then our final exam is scheduled for, where's my, there it is. Our final exam is scheduled for December 7th from 11 a.m. till 1.30 p.m. This will be a comprehensive final and it will be on uh, Top Hat. So it's the same old Top Hat exam. It's just gonna be a little bit longer than the other ones and it will cover all 11 chapters we've gone over so far. Okay, it's gonna be evenly uh, distributed across those 11 chapters. Our exam on Wednesday will be focusing on modules eight, nine, 10, and 11. So that's how we should look at those types of <coughs> uh, study divisions that we have. All right, questions on the exam, the final exam, or what we're gonna do today? Okay. Let me go ahead and share my screen. And again, I have a couple more slides I'm adding to this specifically for module 11 that we probably won't get to today, but I will have them uploaded to Canvas here shortly. Okay, so let me go ahead and share my screen. And I wanna send a PowerPoint. You should see a PowerPoint here for, um, let me actually move it down here so that I can see that. All right, so you should see that Oh, where to go? Uh, the group activity will be covering actually only chapter 11 is the only thing that will be covered in our group uh, thing today. Um, and I have to stop sharing because I don't know where my screen went. Uh, was that it right there? No. My, oh, there it is, maybe. Yeah, it, it got hidden somehow. All right, let me go ahead and try to share my screen again. Uh, share screen and PowerPoint, and let me minimize this thing so we can have that bigger. All right, so again, you'll find this on Canvas. It'll be a PDF and it'll be up by the end of uh, the day. So what I wanted to hit on this chapter three review is kind of some high points of the different chapters. We've learned a lot about different reactions. And so in this one, we're gonna start focusing with reactions of alkenes. And when we look at these reactions, we're looking at regioselective and stereoselective reactivity in the reagents, okay? So that's what we need to think about. And as you build a reaction table, which is actually our activity today, you can go back to this chapter and build in a, a table that includes something about regioselectivity or actual, you know, and a way to help remembering that is to determine whether or not the system, is, how the, what the mechanism worked like. So uh, this is kind of a review of most of the types of reactions we'll see on there. Let me see if I can get this a little bit bigger without going too crazy, okay? So for when we have our alkenes, one of the reactions we have is the hydrohalogenation. And because of the mechanism, we get both syn and anti-addition. We go through that carbocation. So that's something to pay attention to when you're studying this chapter here, just adding any kind of acid and uh, the uh, a, if there's a catalyst necessary, that's important. But it's going through that uh, carbocation intermediate, which means it's gonna get a mixture of syn and anti, and there's nothing we can do about it. So we, we have to know that. 
When we do this acidic hydration right here, it's exactly the same. We're going through a carbocation, which means we have set an anti-addition. However, in the formation of the halohydrin or the halogenation reaction, we have an intermediate that blocks one side of that thing. And so we only get anti-addition. And so that's very important that we have that. We have that anti-addition because of the mechanism. So paying attention to that is very important. Now in the hydroboration, because of our reaction, we actually have a very good selectivity both with sterics and electronics, making it have us a syn-only addition. And we get that syn-only addition when we do oxidation with osmium tetroxide or with the hydrogenation, but then we get something different happening when we have something like permanganate. Okay, so paying attention to the sin and anti is important during this, uh, specifically with this exam. Okay, so again, when we're looking at that, we think about the hydrohalogenation and Markovnikov's rule. We get a mixture that sin and anti because that carbocation, but that carbocation also determines where things are going to happen. Okay, so that means that we are always gonna form the more stable carbocation, which means the hydrogen is always gonna to add to the least substituted carbon. That's the most important part about our Markovnikov's rule. And we have to pay attention to that with our syn and anti-addition as well. And because we're forming that carbocation, we can have the, the nucleophile come in from the top or the bottom, hence the syn addition coming in from the top, the anti-addition coming in from the bottom, and therefore we have a mixture. Now, when we move to the halohydrin reaction, uh, oh, and the right here, the mechanism of the hydration reaction is exactly the same. It's just we're using water, okay? Now, when we have that halohydrin reaction, we have that intermediate, that bromonium anion, that bromonium uh, cation that holds its position. And that's why we have anti-addition exclusively. No rearrangement, nothing happens. We have anti-addition exclusively. And if we don't have a lot of bromine around, we can actually have water act as our nucleophile. And that's how we go for just a halogenation reaction where we get the dibromo compound or the halogenation with an, uh, with an alcohol on there or the halohydrin reaction. Again, exactly the same mechanism. When we move on to things like the um, hydroboration, the electronic factors of this, because the boron is more electropositive, it's going to want to add the boron to the least substituted carbon. So technically it gives us an anti-Markovnikov's product, but it's because of the electronic structure. Now, it's also because of sterics, because this boron is much more bulky than the hydrogen coming over here. So again, the boron goes to the least substituted product, but because of that steric effect as well. That's why we get that alcohol after we oxidize it off on the least substituted carbon, which is backwards from the Markovnikov's rule. Okay. So, and then oxymercurization, it actually undergoes that different regioselectivity. The mercury always adds to the least substituted uh, one, giving us our alcohol on our most substituted when it happens. Okay. So we have that, but it, so because it's regiospecific, it gives us that Markovnikov's addition. But it doesn't go through a carbocation intermediate, so we don't have rearrangement. That's the joy of using the oxymercurization reaction. And so by thinking about selectivity of reagents, we can choose one substrate and make a primary alcohol, secondary alcohol, or tertiary alcohol from it. All right, so then, so this is kind of a summary of the things that are uh, sin and anti, sin only, and some things that are anti only. I didn't go into hydration or the halo hydro formation because it's, um, those are covered in the chapter, but I wanted to hit some highlights for us as well. Uh, the next thing we got to remember is in this chapter here, we got to remember what oxidation states are because as we go from our alkane to our carboxylic acid, we are further and further oxidizing the system. And this gives us an idea of, okay, now we have oxidizers and reducers and selectively choosing our oxidizer to make it more oxidized or our reducing agent and make it more reduced is the key, the selectivity we have in that system. So if we look at an oxidizer like a osmium tetroxide or the permanganate here, 
because of this intermediate, we get a nice syn addition of the oxidation we have here. And so because the osmium holds on, forms this osmate ester, we only get the two alcohols in the same addition. However, if we do that reaction in other systems, like basic permanganate, we get different products. So pay attention to what products we get. Uh, we have ozonolysis here. Ozonolysis is really cool because it clips our double bond, giving us two carbonyls. And eventually, and if that carbonyl was an aldehyde, it'll decompose into, uh, it can decompose into a carboxylic acid as well, depending on what we have here. So if we work it up correctly with a not, without an oxidizer, we can maintain that aldehyde. If we work it up with an oxidizer like peroxide, we get the carboxylic acid. But notice it always clips the double bond. All the other structures remain the same. It only attacks the double bond. And remember the mechanism for that. That had a really interesting mechanism of a uh, ringed system. All right, that's gonna switch us over to module nine, which is alkynes. Again, these are fast. If you have questions, go ahead and ask them. I'm just kind of hitting the high points so that we can make sure we remember what they are and that what I want you to kind of pay attention to. So when we make alkynes, we kind of make them like alkenes, but you have to have two halogens and two hydrogens to create that double bond. And you remove one of those hydrogens and uh, the halogen to create our double bond. And then you can remove a second group of them to create our triple bond. And we have to use a very strong base like uh, sodium amide or something like that. But it, the two halogens can be on either the carbons next to each other or on the same carbon. Doesn't matter, it'll go to an alkyne if you add enough of a strong base. So the other thing we need to think about is that because of the structure of this triple bond, it's the most acidic of the hydrocarbons, okay? So that we can use that advantage of having that alkynal hydrogen removing that alkynal hydrogen to generate our, our acetylide ion. And now we can use that acetylide ion as a nucleophile, okay? Now it's much more acidic than any of the other ones. And so, and it has everything to do with the idea of its hybridization, All right? So moving right along, if nobody has questions. Uh, and they undergo a many of the exact same reactions that the alkenes do, okay? They, it, and they undergo them under the same mechanisms as the alkenes do. They just, some things have a little bit are, are different. For example, if you use only one equivalent of the, um, in this case, uh, the hydrogen halides or the acids right here, we're gonna end up with a cis or with an, an alkene Again, where the hydrogen is added to the one with the more hydrogen, so it follows my common cost rule, but it stops at the alkene. If we add a second equivalent, that, that alkene is then consumed and turned into either, in this case with halogens, it's a tetrahalo compound, or it would turn it into a dibromo compound if we added a second equivalent up here. So it's the same reactions, and we can do it stepwise if we do use our stoichiometry correctly. Okay, another thing that's a little different than the alkenes is when we reduce down our alkynes um, with uh, hydrogen on palladium, it will initially form the cis alkene because that's always a cis addition, but it never stops there. It's still reactive and it goes all the way to the alkane. However, if you want to stop it, you have to use this poisoned catalyst or Lindler's catalyst, and it will give you the cis alkene because it has to add the hydrogen cis at the surface of the metal. However, you can stop it at the transalkene if you use a different mechanism. When we look at this dissolving metal reduction, we actually go through a carbanion, which allows us to gain the, the, cis, the trans configuration because we have an anti-addition and we get our trans. So we can get hydrocarbon cis addition, I mean, uh, cis alkene or transalkene by choosing our reagent carefully. All right, uh, somebody was in the rating room, sorry. Okay, so and then these are all very similar reactions. They're a little bit different than the alkene reactions, but they're very similar in their first attack. And you just have to figure out whether or not they're going to uh, further oxidize or stop at a certain place. For example, ozonolysis, uh, if we, 
if we start uh, hydrating the alkene, we don't get an alcohol like we do with the hydration of alkene. We actually end up with aldehydes and ketones. So look for the slightly different, but that first step in the mechanism is the same for all of these as they were for the alkenes, but we end up with slightly different products. So I think that compare and contrast is very important. Okay, for module nine, the big ones are proton NMR, the four important factors of proton NMR, what the different parts of the proton NMR are, the chemical shift, the splitting pattern, the different number of peaks based on the different types of hydrogens in their relative intensities. But don't forget, we also have to do the number uh, is this part that's integrated under the all of the peaks, not just the height of the peaks. And then of course, splitting is one of those things that's gonna give a, a little bit of trouble. Here's some common splitting patterns. Remember, we're gonna follow that N plus one rule. And it's all, N is all of the hydrogens within three bonds of your unique hydrogen you're splitting or that set of hydrogens you're splitting. So your set, your splitting counts as your one and all the ones within three are the others. Carbon's a little easier because all we have to do is observe different types of carbons and their shifts. That makes it a little easier. And mass spec's a little easier because you're only looking for four things. Molecular ion peak, which is usually the highest molecular weight peak. Base peak, which is usually the tallest peak. The relative abundance tells you if the fragments are common or, or very uncommon. And the fragmentation pattern can give you ideas that, oh, this is a straight chain hydrocarbon, or this has a branch, or this has other things. So that's the important part there. And yes, I know I'm going through this quick. I just want to hit some highlights here. And these, these slides, again, will be posted to Canvas. And then the last module I have prepared for us today is this one. And so I will, uh, uh, and then I'll actually be talking about chapter 11, module 11 during our activity. So radicals, and the idea of the radical is very important because it does different chemistry. It's the most different chemistry we've done so far because only one electron is doing it, okay? Now we have to then think about the energy, the bond association energies and the relative trends we have here. So there's these five, um, six trends in that how we can know what's gonna happen, what's gonna form and how easy or, or it is to make them or not. For example, hyperconjugation is, helps uh, decrease the bond strength or having a nonpolar bond like two oxygens decreases bond strength. And so you can look for all these things that cause things to be initiated by these weaker bonds. These bond association energies are important. Whenever we have a radical reaction, it is a chain reaction because you're only using one electron. So that one electron, when it reacts to form a new sigma bond in our, in, in our initiation stage, usually takes place between like two oxygens or two halogens where you give it light and energy. Those create our homolytic cleavage and we each have one electron on each. When that reacts with a neutral substrate, it generates another radical. So that's that propagation step. So it's constantly generating a new radical until you have two radicals terminate. Two radicals have to react with each other to form that sigma bond and that terminates the reaction. But until that point, it just keeps going and going and going and going. Okay, um, somebody raise their hand. Um, yeah, I had a question on, can you explain the relationship between um, bond strength and stability and like potential energy? Okay, so if we look at, let me see, do I have that slide still up? Um, yeah, I actually have another, let me share a different one here. Um, let me sh uh, change my sh stop share and I'm going to share um, this one, okay? So uh, that's a very good question. So the idea is that when we are looking at the, just the formation of our radical, the easier it is to break that bond, the more likely it is to form a radical. Now, as far as the stability of the radical, 
the stability of the radical kind of follows the stability of carbocations, although not as dramatically, okay? So if we look at the potential energy versus the radical formed, notice it's much easier to form the radical if we have a tertiary carbocation, I'm sorry, a tertiary radical versus the secondary radical, the primary or the methyl radical. And so that the relative potential energy of these means that we would try to form whenever possible that tertiary radical. And it has the same reason that we like to form the carbocations on that tertiary position is because that adjacent uh, sp3 hybridized orbital with the hydrogen can overlap electrons to help share that, uh, that highly uh, energetic state. And because of this hyperconjugation, it gains us the same stability trends we see in carbocations. Did that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay, so I'm gonna switch back to this here because it's almost time to switch over to our uh, other one. Let's see, this one, all right. So again, radicals have those three steps. You initiate with usually something a very weak bond, like an oxygen-oxygen bond or a per acid or something like that. And then that propagation goes to continuing those radicals until we have a radical-radical termination. Now, because of that, we have the idea that if we have very high reactivity, and we went through the, uh, the whole series of fluorine, bromine, chlorine, and iodine, the more reactive they are, the less selective they are, and they're gonna just end up being anywhere on the system. It doesn't have to be the most stable system. If they have low reactivity, they can wait around for the, the, the system to find its more uh, energy stable form and then do that reaction. So when we look at the selectivity of these halogenation reactions, we also can kind of look at it in the same trend as we see with the carbocations. If you have a weak nucleophile and a nice stable tertiary carbocation, it's gonna wait around and give you that nucleophile attacking on that most stable carbocation, even if it had time to rearrange. But radicals don't rearrange. We do not have a mechanism for the radicals to rearrange, so they stay where they're put. Okay. And I think that's the last slide I have so far. I'll, I'll include three more reactions on the radicals and all of chapter 11 in the slides I'll be posting to uh, Canvas. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing now. Now, that brings us to our activity. Okay, so my task for you, and I'll start you off with, uh, let me um, pull up this one right here. My task for you for this one here, and I'm gonna break you out into rooms, is that we are going to make what I call a reaction table, okay? And so let me pull up a reaction table for a chapter we haven't done yet, so, but you can get the idea of what I'm being and, and what I'm gonna do. So our activity today is to make a reaction table for chapter module one, uh, 10.1, just the alcohols, and make it in a way that you understand it. And then what you'll do is you'll upload that and give it. Uh, and then hopefully you'll see the value of it and you'll continue to use it in your studies. Okay, so let me pull up my screen here. Share screen. All right, so here's your task, okay? And we're gonna break out in a little room so you can kind of get used to this. Uh, I actually have, uh, Nicholas has actually talked me into adding another row here, so, <coughs> but you'll get the idea. For each and every reaction in chapter 10, I want you to come up with a kind of a general scheme for that reaction. and I'll do one of the first ones with you. And then when you do this, I want in your table, the things that you would start the reaction with, the things that the, the, that reaction would give you products for, and then what conditions are required, 
And then also there's another thing which is selectivity. So is it regioselective? Is it uh, stereoselective? Is it, you know, what kind of selectivity does it have? Does it always make an inversion center? Does it always make a carbocation? So it's always a mixture. Those kind of things are important to the system so that when you're stemming this, you can work on it. So <coughs> in my table here, I have it listed as the, this actually is a named reaction. And because it's a named reaction, um, I just have those over here. You can probably do like oxidation of alcohol with uh, this, uh, with the chromic acid. That would be like one of the reactions we'll, we'll start with here. And then the starting material, and when you draw the starting material, you need to draw it such that all the parts that participate in that reaction are shown. So for example, in this particular reaction, we have to have hydrogens on this carbon next to this carbonyl to make the reaction happen. So that's why those are drawn there. These other R groups can be anything else, it doesn't matter. But you have to have these three, you have to have that CH2, the carbonyl, and that oxygen there to make this reaction happen. And then what a generalized scheme of your product would be. And then what kind of conditions, like this one we have to use uh, bases that are the same as the ester, okay? <coughs> and then over here, uh, this one actually doesn't have any um, sin or anti-selectivity, but it always attacks at this one carbon. So it does have a regioselectivity based on um, how the reaction reacts. Okay, so that's what a reaction table looks like. Now let's build one with our, um, where's my blank, there it is. Let's build one with one of the reactions from our um, chapter 10, okay? So you just have to start it with a drawing it right here and you can be drawn. In fact, you could uh, just print up a table out of Excel if you wanted and just hand draw it. I, I just did it this way because I wanted to, actually I was doing the entire book to make sure I got all of the reactions in. So let's do a reaction of, okay. Uh, let's not do the Grignard reaction. Let's not do the acetylene reaction. Let's do one of the oxidations. Ah, let's do a reduction. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen over here now. Oh, no, I'm gonna not. I'm gonna share my screen over here. Okay, so we're gonna do, for this one, we're gonna do a reduction of with L, A, H, okay? So, in, in our little table we're building here. We're gonna do reduction LAH. So things that we're gonna see with this is, this is gonna be a um, syn addition right here because the way it's, it's gonna add across that carbonyl compound. And it only reacts with carbonyls, okay? So we know we have a regioselectivity part of it. So this is the regio and this is the um, stereo. It's gonna give us a syn addition. But what do we need to make this thing happen? Well, the simplest one we can do is, well, if we had a ketone, so our generalized ketone would be this, and we used LAH, which we might wanna draw it out for ourselves, lithium, aluminum hydride is LAH. Maybe we can put that here or put that here on your table, wherever you want. And then know that when we react a carbonyl like this with LAH, we end up with our new product. So we have our R group here, our R group here, we have our O. And then I do it in a different color ink so that you can see where things are added, okay? So when we have our carbonyl, when we have our ketone reacting with our uh, carbonyl, we end up with a secondary alcohol, okay? So this would be one reaction you would have in your reaction table, okay? Now, the second reaction we might wanna have in our reaction table here is, well, since we already have LAH, what are the three other things that LAH does react with? Well, we have LAH that can react with an aldehyde. We have LAH that can react with formaldehyde. 
but we also have LAH will react with esters, right? That's one strong enough to react with esters. And we need to think about what the products would be from each of these right here, okay? And LAH will even react with carboxylic acids, okay? So this is obviously gonna make a uh, primary alcohol, right? So this is gonna give us a ROH plus our H here and our H here. So that means that this is still reacting with the carbonyl, it's still doing syn addition. When we do it with uh, the next one now, it's gonna be, oh, we're gonna do R. No, we don't have an R. We only have H, H, O, H. We create methanol when we use formaldehyde in this reaction. When we have this ester right here, we're going to reduce it completely down to an alcohol. So we're gonna add two hydrogens here plus an OH. And our drip, we started with this O and this here. So in the table I want you to build, I want you to go ahead and think about all the different types of things. Now, what's the next stage? Okay, let's see which of these groups react with uh, sodium borohydride. We know we only have to do two of these for sodium borohydride because it only reacts with aldehydes and ketones. Sodium borohydride does not react with the, uh, and this is just an aldehyde, uh, does not react with esters or carboxylic acids. So our table gets simpler. All right, do you understand what we're going to be doing today? Um, let's see, the, uh, I have a question here. The NMR activity is not part of the grade uh, because Canvas doesn't count it. Toward, it it's, it's a bonus activity. It will count as points toward one of your chapters. Uh, just chapter 10. Yeah, just, chap, just alcohols. That's all I need you to do for this activity is just alcohols. If you want to continue this with the, uh, with the e ethers and all of the alkenes and alkynes for reviewing for this test, I highly suggest that. In fact, once you build these tables, you can use them next semester as we move on to all these different reactions, helping you remember all the reactions we've learned this year. Okay, so this is kind of a, a capstone thing. Uh, so uh, SI sessions will do this for all chapters, by the way. They're going to uh, build uh, uh, these activity tables for each of the chapters. And yes, they will be every uh, this week, every day. Okay. okay, have I answered all questions in the chat? I think I have. Uh, we are only gonna do chapter, not 10, I'm sorry, not chapter 10, chapter 11, alcohols. Chapter 11.1, .1, only alcohols. That's all we're gonna do today. And if you wanna go back and do them all, that's up to you. Uh, and so again, it's due at midnight tonight, so you can, you know, start with your team, figure out what's important, how to build it. Maybe you have a better idea for how to organize this. Maybe you think differently than I do. And so if you gather together and figure out what you want on your table and then add a few things it, by the rest of the time, and then you take, go off and finish it yourself. The other part is you really kind of have to do this yourself. You can find them printed up online, but by building it yourself, You've gone back and reviewed things. You've thought about cis. You've thought about trans. You've thought about uh, regioselectivity. You've thought about the mechanism. So you know it might take you you know to do an entire chapter, maybe an hour, but that counts as hour toward you study. Okay. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and stop recording. Um,